Hello everybody, I'm Dave Eagle, I run the Stargazing Planetarium and today I'm going to be talking about Tim Peake's Principia mission and talk about what that means for STEM. Well, we're going to here to talk about Tim Peake today. Of course, he's our first official astronaut, but actually he's not the first Brit to go into space. Helen Sharman was the first person from the United Kingdom to go into space and she was launched with the Russians or the Soviet Union as they were known then in 1991 and she was a chemist and came from Sheffield. So she is the first person born in the UK who actually flew to space. But it was 25 years before another Brit properly followed her. There were some more people uh, but they had to become US citizens to actually become astronauts for the United States and NASA. Okay, so Tim was selected for the European Space Agency because in 2008, the European Space Agency said they would accept astronaut applications. So people could apply to become an astronaut with the European Space Agency. Nearly eight and a half thousand people applied. Can you imagine going through all that paperwork? And out of that eight and a half thousand nearly, 900 people were selected to go forward. So they were given lots of exercises to, to make sure they had the brains, make sure they had the fitness to cope with being launched into space. And that screening process took over nearly a year or so. And uh, eventually six astronauts were offered places with the European Astronaut Corps. And Tim, of course, was one of those. Here he is, he was born in Chichester in 1972, and for his day job, he actually tested Apache helicopters. So he was a little bit like the old Apollo and Mercury astronauts who had test pilot backgrounds. And well done to him, he worked hard and he managed to get qualified enough to become an astronaut. He went through lots of survival training, although the Soyuz spacecraft, because he was being launched by the Russians, it comes down on land, just in case it didn't quite go to plan. He was taught how to get out of the spacecraft if it landed on water and then attract attention. And of course, if they went off target and didn't land where they were meant to, and it took them a few days to actually find them, they were taught how to become self-sufficient in the wild, just in case and also lots of team building exercises in caves and all sorts of things because to work in the close confinements of space you need to work as a team and this really tests to see whether or not they could work as a team and of course he did he passed all the training and he managed to get a flight and that was on the principia mission here they are we got tim peak on the left from the uk tim copra on the right from the United States and Yuri Malenchenko who was Russian and he was the Soyuz spacecraft pilot so it was his responsibility to actually get them to the International Space Station and after launch it took them six hours to get up to the International Space Station 240 miles above the earth but don't forget although Tim worked really hard and was selected out of those four and a half thousand people there are lots of other jobs that you could do to be involved in a mission like this. You don't have to be the very, very best, but as long as you're good, you could get a job because there's thousands of people underneath the astronauts that do just as important a job. Engineers, mathematicians, medical people, all sorts of jobs, thousands of them underneath that support those missions and make sure that they can do the jobs when they get into space. So even if you're not quite good enough to be an astronaut, you could potentially do one of those other jobs and be involved in something absolutely fantastic. So work hard. So here's the Principia mission patch and you can see there's a big clue right in the middle of the logo. Here you can see a falling apple. And you can just about see this is a reflection and it looks a little bit like the space station. So the falling apple is the clue because Principia comes from this guy, Sir Isaac Newton, who was a brilliant scientist. He studied light amongst lots of other things and he also invented the Newtonian telescope. So it's named after him. And we still use those telescopes as amateur astronomers today to look at the night sky. 
and in 1687 he published this called the Principia Mathematica and in that there was lots of mathematics and he came up with three laws of motion and these laws of motions and the mathematics involved in, with them despite the fact they're 300 years old we still use those today to get objects in orbit and send them out to the other objects in the solar system and they built on Kepler's laws of planetary motion which were published in 1609. So what's it all about? Well there were three laws. I'm not going to talk about the first two but the third one is one that helps us launch a rocket which is what they did Tim. And that states that to every action there is always opposed an equal reaction or the way we may say it today to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So what does this mean? Well, if you had a boat and it was alongside a jetty, here's the jetty here, here's the boat on the water. And if you had a boy in the boat and he wanted to jump out of the boat onto the jetty, he would jump in that direction. The trouble is, because he's jumping in that direction, when he jumps off the boat, he actually puts a force on the boat and the boat goes off in the opposite direction and that's newton's third law in action for every action an equal and opposite reaction so some of the energy that he had to jump onto the jetty has been taken away by the movement of the boat so perhaps he hasn't got enough in his jump to actually get onto the jetty and he falls in the water Let's have a look how this works. If we were to take a fire extinguisher and secure it onto a skateboard, and then we let the uh, fire extinguisher off, the gas would come out in that direction. And then because the gas is coming out in that direction, it would push on the cylinder, and then that would push the cylinder in the opposite direction. And because it's secured to the skateboard, it goes off in the opposite direction to the gas. And that is how they launch a rocket into space. The gas coming out of the bottom of the rocket pushes the rocket upwards and look at my bottom rocket workshop for details of how that works. Now, How to get a rocket into space and launch it is a little bit like firing a bullet. Here we go if we've got a gun over on the right hand side and a target on the left and we load a bullet into the gun and fire it at the target, we normally think that the bullet would go straight towards the target in a straight line. When I go into schools, I take Nerf guns and bullets in with me, and I get children to demonstrate this quite nicely. And what we find is that doesn't actually happen. What happens is when we put our bullet in the gun and we fire it at the target, it actually drops towards the ground in an arc like that. So there's something going on. And the further away your gun is from the target, the harder and harder it is for it to get to the target because it drops towards the ground much sooner than it can reach the target. There's something acting on the bullet. And that is gravity. And we know all about gravity, not only from Sir Isaac Newton, but before him, there was also this guy called Galileo Galilei. He did lots of work as well. He was one of the first people to look at the night sky with a telescope. So we like him for that. He made lots and lots of discoveries. And he also played with gravity. He went to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and he dropped different objects of different mass from the top of the tower. And what he noticed was it didn't matter what the difference in mass was, a high mass object would hit the ground at exactly the same as a low mass object if it was dropped from exactly the same height. So gravity was constant, irrespective of how much mass there was in the object being dropped. And that was demonstrated really nicely by Dave Scott on the surface of the moon. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than 
on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Which proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. So there you see, if a feather and a hammer are dropped at exactly the same time, from exactly the same height, they hit the ground at exactly the same time. Because gravity is the same for both objects. So if we're launching a rocket, how do we do that? Well, let's have a look at our gun again. Here we've got the gun over here on the right hand side and we've got the ground below us and we fire our bullet out of the gun it arcs around gravity pulls towards the earth and it hits the ground that's what we're used to if we use a higher velocity bullet instead of a nerf gun we use a high velocity bullet that's going really fast and what happens is that that leaves the gun it goes further it's still pulled towards the ground and then it comes to hit the ground in an arc, but it's gone much further away from the gun. That makes sense. We can understand that. I can understand that. But if we redraw the figure, here's the gun, and here's the direction we're going to fire the bullet in. If we drop a bullet from the same height as the gun, and at the same time fire one of our Nerf gun bullets, and we fire one of our high velocity bullets, all at the same time, what you will find is that as they leave the gun, they drop to earth at exactly the same time. If you drop something, it hits the ground just below where you've dropped it from, because we've given it no energy. The low velocity bullet, like a Nerf gun bullet, that would go and then hit the ground a little bit further away from where the thing that you dropped where you gave it no energy but the high velocity bullet has gone much much further but it still hit the ground because it's not fast enough but they all hit the ground at exactly the same time the only difference between the three objects hitting the ground is the distance they were from where you fired them okay so it's the drop to the earth always takes exactly the same time. And that helps us calculate how to get a rocket into orbit. Let me show you how. Here's what we've done. We've got the earth here. Here's the earth, the curve of the earth. Here's what we've done. We've got the gun and we fire the bullet. And gravity pulls it down towards the earth till it hits the ground. But if you fire that bullet really, really fast, it does a really strange thing. Here it goes, it's left the gun. Gravity is still pulling it down because if you remember, things should go in a straight line. But it doesn't. Gravity is pulling it down towards the Earth, so it's curving. But you can see as it drops towards the Earth, because the Earth's curved away from it, it actually stays in orbit. But it has to be going really, really fast to be able to do that. How fast does our bullet have to be to stay in orbit? Well, a high velocity bullet is 687 kilometers an hour speed. That's about 427 miles per hour. But that's still attracted by gravity and comes down to Earth. To stay in orbit, you have to get something to move at a speed of 40,270 kilometers per hour. What happens if you go faster than that speed? If it goes faster than 40,270 kilometers an hour, what you'll find is it's still attracted by the Earth's gravity. You can see it's curved here. But because it's traveling so fast, it's gradually getting further and further away from Earth. And so by making something faster than that, we can actually move away from the Earth and explore different areas of the solar system. The faster you go, the quicker you move away from the Earth and it escapes from Earth's gravity. And that is called reaching escape velocity. And this is exactly how they launch a rocket. 
So here's the launch pad, the little red dot here, and they always launch rockets going in the same direction as the spin of the Earth. So imagine the Earth is spinning in that direction, and you've got your rocket on the launch pad, and they always launch vertically to get above most of this atmosphere first. And then once they get up above most of the atmosphere, they turn on their side and then build up speed so that they can stay in orbit. So there's a rocket launched, gathering speed, and then it goes into orbit. And that's exactly how Tim Peake and the Principia crew got into orbit in their Soyuz rocket. And it took them six hours to get up to the International Space Station, about 240 miles above the Earth's surface. Tim, before he went, did a lot of underwater training because this replicates what they experience when they get to the space station. Once they get into orbit, they get something called zero G. There is gravity 240 miles above the Earth, but it's 90% of what we feel on Earth. So if you could feel it, it would, wouldn't feel really that much different to what we feel here. But because they're falling around the Earth all the time, what we call free fall, they experience zero G. The crew and everything that's on the International Space Station is weightless while they're there. And that affects the body. It affects the ears. If you've ever had an ear infection, you really wouldn't want to uh, feel sick because that creates nausea, which makes you feel really sick. And if you're sick in space, that's really not a good thing to want. It affects the eyesight. So there's uh, one of the astronauts looking at changes in the eye and they found that fluid collects in the head because gravity doesn't pull the blood towards your feet like it does normally does on Earth. Then fluid builds up in the head and it affects your eyesight. And you also get taller. Here's your spine and those discs in between the vertebra in your spine get compressed while you're on Earth under gravity. And Tim Peake grew two centimeters while he was in his six month flight. And did you know that when you go to bed, you're actually shorter than when you get up in the morning because of the same reason, but not quite as much as Tim because he's relaxed quite a lot over those six months he was up there. And bones weaken as well. We always think of bones as being really hard, which they are, but they've got this matrix inside. And so they look sort of hollow and they need lots of minerals to actually keep them hard and those minerals that the body puts into those body are calcium and phosphorus and they keep the bones as hard as possible the trouble is your body senses that they're not they don't need to be as hard because there's no gravity and so it decides not to put so much calcium or phosphorus into the bones themselves so they do become weak potentially over time while you're at zero g and also food stuff Food stuff, you have to make sure you eat enough food stuff so that you can uh, replenish those and their dairy products and soy products as well that they need to make sure the astronauts eat plenty of those to make sure their bones are as strong as they can be over the time they're on the space station. Their muscles also waste away as well and they have to do two hours exercise every day to make sure that they are exercising properly and making sure that their muscles don't waste away while they're up there. This is Scott Kelly after he landed. His mission lasted 12 months and he, he overlapped Tim by three months while he was there. And he had a twin brother called Mark. And what happened to Scott's body while, while he was up on the International Space Station was compared with Mark's so that they could see if the long duration zero G had an effect on Scott while he was up there. And those experiments continued at least a year after he got back. So, Tim, what did Tim do while he was up there? Well, he did a spacewalk, he took lots of pictures, but the outreach was fantastic. Getting children excited is what I love about doing what I do with the planetarium. And the excitement at the Science Museum for the launch day would have been absolutely amazing. There was a space seeds experiment, which lots of schools took part in. There were blue and yellow seeds. The blue seeds were actually flown into space. And overall, when the growth of the seeds were measured, there was no difference in the growth of the seeds. So they weren't affected by being flown into space. So that's good news if astronauts want to take seeds up to grow on a remote planet if they take them with them. And then 18th of June, eventually, they landed after six months 
on the Principia mission and here's the Soyuz capsule scorched when it landed back in Russia. But this is what it's all about. Tim has been getting out to children and getting them really enthusiastic about space and space flight. And that's what I like to do when I go into schools. So get children interested in lots of STEM subjects. What do we mean by STEM subjects? Well, it's science, technology, engineering, and maths. And we need more children taking up those subjects, especially girls. We're very short on girls in taking up those subjects. A little while ago, I went to a talk by Tim and he was asked a question by a nine year old boy, which may be quite emotional. And I'm going to play the question for you so you can hear what he asked. Hello, Hello. my name is Isaac and I am nine years old. My teacher asked my class to think of a challenge and how to overcome it. I put down that my challenge was to become an astronaut and I would overcome this by working really hard and being accepted into the NASA space program. My teacher wasn't happy with this. She said we were, suppo she said we were supposed to pick something realistic. Well, well, you were once a nine-year-old boy. My question is, but when the people around you but were telling you to the impossible and during the time that felt like they were right, how, how did you stay motivated and never give, on, give up on your dream to become an astronaut? You're my hero, Tim P. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Isaac. So you can imagine, after being asked that question, Tim had the same answer that I'm going to give you now. What are you passionate about? Find out what you're really passionate about and see if you can make that your career. You will have targets you'll need to achieve to actually get there, but set achievable targets and do it in little steps and you'd be amazed how far you can go. And don't let anyone, whoever they are, tell you what you can or can't do as your career. It's your career. You've got to work hard to get there, but if you do work hard, you will get there. Follow your dreams. And you really don't know how much you could achieve if you really do put your mind to it and work hard and really try. I hope you've enjoyed learning about Tim Peake's Principia mission and some of Newton's laws. And hopefully I'll see you in a school sometime soon. Thank you very much.